Right, so this is a continuation of last week's uh, um, talk. Um, and today we are going to talk about anomalous and heavy atom density. Um, first of all, I think, oh. No, I'm wanting to advance the slide. Let's see. Now, um, the next lecture is, I repeat this lecture in the afternoon is Ruby, and then advanced Schellig CDE, um, which you can listen to on the 29th of September in Struby, or a week later at Diamond Light Source. And um, if you want the slides or the tutorial, um, you can go to my homepage and find them there. And uh, you also get a chocolate if you interrupt me with a question, just to make that clear. Um, so if you get bored, you just have to come up with a question. Now, last week we talked about this, which is you have the structure factors, which consist of amplitudes that come from your intensities and phases. Um, and with a Fourier transform, we can get to electron density. And in the electron density, we can usually build a structural model. So if we know all the structure factors from the electron density, we can get the structure. Now, this can be translated in amplitudes and phases, give you a map. But at the beginning of our experiment, uh, at the end of our experiment before we start phasing, we don't know the phases yet. We only know the intensities or the amplitudes we can derive from them. Now, what happens if we do a Fourier transform where we set all phases to zero and use the intensities instead of the amplitudes? Basically, we use what we have. Um, if we do that, we get something that is called a Patterson map that will contain some of the information about the structure already because the intensities have been created by the crystal, by the diffraction. But it will not contain all the information because we set all phases to zero. Um, more exactly, and I will illustrate this in a moment, the Patterson maps contain all interatomic vectors between all atoms in the structure. So you can imagine you've got two atoms and you could draw a vector connecting them either in this direction or in the other direction. That would be the interatomic vector. The vectors are weighted by the electrons of the atoms linked. So two heavy atoms give you a stronger peak in the Patterson map. And they are correct in direction. But we don't know the origin <coughs> and we don't know the orientation of the vectors relate relative to each other. They all start at zero, zero, zero. Because we get vectors for all interatomic distances that we can think of, um, Patterson maps tend to be very crowded for proteins. So you can imagine this looks possibly quite all right if you've got like four atoms, but it doesn't look very nice and interpretable if you've got a hundred or a thousand. But they're still characteristic for the protein, which is exploited in molecular replacement. So what does it look like exactly? Imagine you have this molecule. It's got a carbon here and an oxygen there, and it has two hydrogens. Who knows what that is? All right, it looks like I get a chocolate. It's formaldehyde. Mm. <laughs> I don't need lunch after this lecture, I think. So this is the Patterson map. Now, how did that come into being? First, we have the vector between the two hydrogens. The vector between the two hydrogens, well, in the Patterson, it starts at the origin here, and because we can also draw from top to bottom, we get another one here. The fact that we can draw in either or the other direction makes the Patterson, by the way, centrosymmetric, which means we lose some information, but well. The orange one between the hydrogen and oxygen gives us this one or that one, and then we have these two, and then these two, 
and so on and so on until we have covered every interatomic and in this case only intramolecular connection there is. In reality, we also get the extramolecular ones, but I didn't bother because I wanted to keep the example simple. No relative positions. And because it's centrosymmetric, the handedness of that structure cannot be explained from this. The number of peaks excluding the zero peak is n squared minus n peaks, with n being the number of atoms that we're looking at. Now, at low re this is high resolution, right? You can see single hydrogens. It's a small molecule thing. Yes? I start from zero, and I put one of the two atoms basically at zero. For example, for the green vector, this one at zero. And then the peak is in the same distance and the same direction. Oh, it's the same direction. Mm -hmm. OK, and then you can do the same thing by putting the other atom at zero. I put every atom in the middle and draw every vector possible. Yes, indeed. Uh, in this case, because the molecule has a symmetry, you would need half of it if the molecule would not have internal symmetry. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting the gist of this. <laughs> now, at lower. <laughs> well, you can share. <laughs> Um, at low resolution, things are not quite so nice. At low resolution, it starts to become kind of difficult to tell how many atoms there were in the beginning in the real map. We have no clue how many were there in the Patterson map. And also, it's kind of like hydrogens, they've gone. And this would be calculate still high resolution for a protein. So this is why we can't use Patterson maps directly to solve protein structures, because we are not so sure anymore of the locations. And also, in a real protein map, you would have thousands of peaks. And it, they would all start at origin, which means that about five angstroms around origin is very crowded. You're also not sure of the number of vectors here. So you're not sure of the number of atoms you have. Um, now, there's a thing called the anomalous Patterson. And that uses intensity differences. So you remember last week we talked that every experimental phasing method uses intensity differences. Either differences between Friedel mates, called anomalous differences, or differences between two crystals that are isomorphous but slightly different, called isomorphous differences, where you have one data set and another data set, and you take the difference between the same HKL indices. Um, now, for an anomalous Patterson map, we take the intensity differences and set all phases to zero. And then we do a Fourier. What we get is called an anomalous Patterson map. Can someone? Tell me what we would call it if we would have isomorphous differences instead of anomalous differences. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh. Oh. Okay. Um, this is a Patterson map from viscotoxin A1, which is, by the way, in a tutorial, the test case. But I suspect no one did a tutorial. So this is visco... I couldn't, couldn't find it, actually. Because it's there. I was on your web page, and I looked, and I couldn't find where the tutorials are. Are they separate from where you did your lectures? No. So what, could you, there is no link to the tutorial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm just confused. It remind me in the end of the lecture that we go online, and I show where it is, so everyone can find it. Um, this is the um, Patterson map of viscotoxin. You can see the crystal structure is symmetric, so there's not only central symmetry, there's, you know, one, two, three, four, something like a fourfold perhaps here. Um, uh, no, a twofold here and a twofold there, actually, because this is not, you know, exactly a fourfold symmetry. Um, and you can see that it's kind of impossible to tell any much information about the molecule just from looking at this. 
but because it's characteristic for the orientation of your protein and also from where it is in the unit cell, these maps can be exploited in molecular replacement and they are for the rotation and translation search. But I'm not going to go into this here. Um, now, if we take the anomalous pattern of the same thing, it becomes a lot less crowded. And that is because now we are only seeing peaks for interatomic distances between anomalous scatterers. If we take the intensity differences, instead of the intensities to generate our pattern, we are only getting peaks that refer to the interatomic distances of the anomalous scatterers or marker atoms for whatever type of experimental phasing experiment we did. And in the old days, people looked at those and solved their substructures. So if an old fashioned person shows you something like this on their screen, you can nod wisely and say, oh, a Harker section. <laughs> it's very important. Um, I was slightly shocked when I saw my first one. Um, now, there's of course another thing we can do. And that is, once we've solved our structure and we know the phases, right? We solved the structure, we know the phases. This happens long after we had any phase problem. We can take the phases we know and the anomalous differences and calculate a map, and that would be the anomalous map. More exactly, we could take only the phases of our anomalous scatterers. Or we could, of course, take the differences between derivative data sets. That would be isomorphous replacement. Or before and after radiation damage, that would be a special case of isomorphous replacement, radiation-induced phasing maps. Also, you could take a data set from before a reaction happened in the crystal and a data set from after a reaction happened in the crystal and do a difference map of these two data sets using the intensity differences between them. Now, this is what it looks like. This is um, viscotoxin B2, not to confuse with A1, because B2 couldn't be solved by SAT phasing. Still, when you take the SAT data and you generate the anomalous map, it becomes very evident that all the peaks were there. So the information was in the data. We could just not exploit it well enough to solve the structure. You can see all the disulfide bridges here. Um, you can see atoms here. Any, anyone an idea what that is? Yes, sulfate. Do you want a chocolate? So at least uh, he moved his mouth. No, oh, sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but there's one sulfate which is kind of not having such a high peak in this map. This one. What would be a potential explanation? There's about three explanations why that could have happened. Any ideas? Hmm? Yes, that's what actually happened. There was only a quarter occupancy on that sulfate. There are two more potential explanations. Yes, there could be a high B factor. Can I throw it? Oh, sorry. Um, and um, the last one could be, this is not actually a sulfate. Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, but it's the deposited PDB and actually it's a sulfate. Um, right, so how do we do this practically in Shellix? Uh, you can calculate anomalous maps with a lot of programs, including CCP4, and there's like, these are not new. These ha have been around for a long time. Um, so I'm talking about Anode, but um, all the technology was already there. Um, the anomalous are, so you take the experimental date, ah no, sorry. This is the normal Shellix workflow, which I wanted to show first. So we had this last week. You take your experimental data and put it in Shellix C. Shellix C calculates the alpha angle and preps your data, giving you a file with the anomalous differences and alpha angle estimate. And hmm? Next slide. Um, um, you go into Shellix D, which finds the substructure. You go into Shellix E for density modification to resolve the handedness of your substructure. 
Um, this is the normal ShellX workflow. This is what you should be doing in the background if you're using HKL to map or CCP force uh, I2 GUI to ShellX or whatever. If you use ShellX, that's about the workflow. The alpha angle is, oh, was that a question by the way? Who, who asked? Oh, okay. Um, you have the total structure factor called FT and you can split it up in two contributions, one from your marker atoms and one from everything else. The one from the marker atoms is called FA, F anomalous scatterers. The other one is called FP, F protein. Um, these two have phase angles. Now, if we take the difference of those, that's the alpha angle. It is the phase of the structure factor minus the phase of only the anomalous scatterers. Now, in experimental phasing, or in anomalous phasing, if we know the phase we expect from our substructure, which we can calculate after we know the positions in the substructure, and if we know the alpha angle, which we can estimate, I showed it last week, there will also be a video in a certain time of that lecture and this lecture, so you will find them online uh, when they're ready. Now, if we have those two, we can calculate the total phase and solve the phase problem. Anode, however, to calculate your anomalous density works the other way around. So the marker atom has an amplitude, or the marker atoms have an amplitude and a phase. The macromolecule, everything has an amplitude and a phase, and the phase relation is the total phase is the anomalous phase plus alpha. This is the equation we just had. Now we can turn it around. If we want the phase only of the anomalous scatterers, we could take the phase of everything that we have after we refine the structure. Remember, when we have refined the structure, the phases are at their best. So, and we can estimate the alpha angle from the anomalous data in the way shown or calculate it if we do a mad experiment via the phasing equations. These were these hilarious long equations that obviously shocked a few people uh, last week, but we can calculate alpha. Now we get in this case the phase of the total structure factor from the PDB of the refined model. The alpha angle we get from Shellac C or XPREP if you're a Brooker user. And then we have the phase of the anomalous scatterers. We just reverse engineered them. And the anomalous differences we also get from Shell XC, they are basically just the difference of one intensity minus the other. And that gives us the map if we do a Fourier transform. Now this is the data flow. You take the experimental data to Shell XC you get a file called name underscore fa.hkl. It has columns, hkl, anomalous difference, estimated or calculated alpha angle. You take the model, name.pdb. The two have the same thing where it says name, but it doesn't need to be name. Once you have two, both of them in the folder, you run an order, and an order gives you three files. Um, so the output contains an average density for each site type. For example, the average density of all sulfurs in methionine, or all sulfurs in cysteine, or all oxygen in water, in case you missed a few anomalous scatterers, because water is not exactly an anomalous, strong anomalous scatterer. Height and coordinates of unique peaks and distance to the next atom in the PDB file in a like list file type output, a map called name.pha, which is a PHS format map to read into CUT. However, in order to read it into CUT, CUT will ask you for a symmetry and unit cell because this is not contained in the map file. And you can circumvent this by just opening the corresponding PDB file before, but you can also choose a PDB or res or ins file to get it. So you have this information, but CUT will ask for it. Um, there will be a name underscore fa dot res for result, and that will be um, 
the substructure only, only the anomalous peaks or isomorphous peaks or whatever kind of experiment you did, and the listing file LSA. You run the program by typing a node and the name of the two files. And then you can give options, but they're optional. So if you have no clue how this again worked, you do like with all ShellX programs and you only type anode or ShellX C or ShellX E. Hit enter and there will come instructions and these manual pages are really good and they're very short. So I can really recommend doing this if you've got no clue and you want to run the program, just give its name and hit enter. Data indices could be inconsistent between the PDB file or the reflection file. If so, the program may issue a warning and you should run it again using minus i. However, there are a few, very few space groups, P31, P32 and P3, which have four indexing options. If you have that problem, try all of these plus no flag at all. And then how do you know which one is correct? There is a trick. I'm not sure, the, I know there's an order users in the room. Oh, that was just scratching. Oh dear. <laughs> um, well, you look at the peak heights you get and the uh, one which gives you the highest peaks is the correct choice. Because if you choose to peak wrong, everything gets muddled up and everything is within the noise sigma level and gives you no high peak. Uh, I'm gonna eat that later. Um, a maximum resolution um, can also be given by minus D for resolution and that's sometimes sensible if your animal signal, for example, only extends to four angstrom, you can give minus D four. Um, and dampening can also be applied, which seems superior in our tests, but is not very of use. Um, here we go again, we had that already. And now I'm gonna give a few examples of application. First is heliotunin D. Um, it's a structure that is rather old and still unpublished because it can't be phased by experimental phasing alone. Um, it's got 46 residues, four disulfide bridges. Um, the crystals are ellipsoidal. We first thought they were bubbles when we first saw them through the microscope. We, the microscope didn't have such a nice resolution and uh, we couldn't see the polarization properly. And they look really like bubbles. But um, we got that and um, we measured it on the home source. And we got a high multiplicity. We also measured at synchrotron also to a high multiplicity but the structure could not be solved by sulfur set. And um, this was the statistics. This is D double prime versus sigma. Um, it's 0 0.8 for no signal. So you can see that uh, this is the resolution, that at low resolution there is some signal. And it evens out to 0 0.8, which is always a good thing. It means the data have been processed correctly because the anomalous signal evens out to nothing. If this would be, you know, 0 0.2 or free, that would be a problem. Um, you can see that statistics were kind of all right. Um, this is what we got from anode. So this is the first anode output we're gonna look at. You can see these are the atom types. So first comes sulfur in cysteine, um, then comes chlorine, um, then comes, but already under the sigma level, something like water and then comes the sodium. Um, so that's good. We know there is anomalous density and then we look at the peaks and the first peak has a height of just over 10 and is a sulfur and is strangely enough close to a lysine. So that possibly means that we missed a position for a cysteine here. The second one is already close to um, a cysteine and um, the peak height is about seven and so goes on the list until at S52 we have a height of four and that's the last correct one, the last one that is output. 
Now, um, Tom Terwilliger has postulated in a recent paper that um, only if the sigma level is over 10, the structure is solvable by experimental phasing. And so far, that seems to be true. So if you have enough peaks with a sigma over 10, <laughs> you can solve your structure by experimental phasing by SAT, for example. If not, no. But of course, you can do this analysis only after you have refined the structure. Yes? Where did the PDB file come from? Uh, I guess this is an, a result from like a half refined structure before deposition. So the PDB file is mine. I deposited it. It's a structure I worked on. But I think that the output was work in progress. So during my refinement, I ran an order. And that will be the reason why this is so strange. OK, here's the anomalous map. Um, it has been re-niced in Pymol. But you can see lots of disulfide bridges. Only four copies. There were seven copies in asymmetric unit. But if you plot all of them, it's very crowded. You can also see there are some disulfide bridges which are not quite as strong, possibly more movable, lower occupied because of radiation damage. Um, but what we tried to do with it is MR sat. Now, in order to get a partial structure, we run phaser, and that was not successful. We had a, a structure that was also a halogenine, uh, or I think crumbine or something. No, halogenine solved with NMR. We ran it. We got an MR solution. That MR solution didn't lead us anywhere. But then Isabelle Son came over the summer. And uh, by that <coughs> time, the data set was nine months old and still hadn't yielded any uh, structure solution. And she put the known closest relative structure, which was the NMR structure, through Archimboldo. And with Archimboldo, she got a result that looked somewhat all right, although phaser TFZ, for those who tells that something, was still under four. Um, and we put this result from MR into a node for the phases, and then ran through the usual process to get the anomalous differences. And from that, we got a substructure. We took the substructure, fed it into Shell XE for density modification, and did hence something that can be called molecular replacement with single wavelength anomalous diffraction, MRSAT. Um, the original paper is by Schurman and Tanner. It's not here. Um, and solved the structure. Now, if we include the phaser solution into our node, the highest peak is four, and only 12 positions are correct. If we put the Archimboldo solution in, the highest peak is nine, much better already. And there are, in hindsight, 54 correct positions in the substructure. And in the final structure, um, there was 12, and then there were 60 correct positions, which at the time, I think, was Arnaud's cutoff. So there were more correct positions, but Arnaud didn't give all of them. Um, and so we could basically solve the structure. However, there is another way for MRSAT, which doesn't use Arnaud, but only Shell XE. And I'm going to talk about this next week, um, which is the more common way of doing MRSAT within Shell X. Um, now, this is an example of thermolysine, so it's standard molecule, uh, measured by Mariana Beadene and Ina Dix at Bessie. The resolution was two angstrom. There was zinc, calcium, and sulfur present. Crystallization had been done with an excess of zinc. Um, there was an unexpected peak, three angstrom from the main zinc site. And Holland et al. in 1995 argued on its nature based on its native density. But it wasn't quite resolved what that second peak next to the zinc was. It looked like, looks like this in the anomalous map. So you calculate your anomalous map. Until then, you, you're not quite sure what has happened. And you see that the second thing, so this is the zinc, and this is another anomalous scatterer. <coughs> but what kind of anomalous scatterer? 
Now, can Anode help us to find this out? If you remember from last week, anomalous scattering has two contributions, F prime and F double prime. And as you go over a certain <laughs> wavelength, the absorption edge, um, F double prime gets very high and F prime gets very low and then goes back to its original value. Now, if we look at the anode output using only the MAT data and look at the peak heights of the different peaks, zinc has 82, calcium has 11, the sulfur has in mean 1.8, the unknown peak has 28, so it's certainly below the zinc but over the average for calcium. The ratio between the calcium and the zinc is 0 0.136 and the ratio between the unknown and the zinc is 0 0.345. Now if we treat every single wavelength we've measured with MAT as its own data set, we can run an order again. We just say that inflection point is a set and peak is a set and high, rem high energy remote is also a set. Um, and then we see zinc um, is at 55, goes up and goes down again. Calcium is first high and then about stays the same. Um, sulfur is a little bit stronger throughout. The unknown peak is at 18, 24, 20. Now if we calculate the ratio, we can see that the calcium to zinc anomalous peak height ratio is high, low, high, while the one between the unknown peak and zinc stays approximately the same. And this is proof that this is not a calcium but a zinc peak. And hence we resolved Holland and Al's problem of the second peak and most likely it's a second zinc which is bridged by oxygens because it's very close. Um, this example is human RNAs T2. It's a fairly standard protein problem. It's a in interesting because if people don't have it, they get very ill. Um, it had a, has a resolution of 2.2, a multiplicity of seven, which wasn't so great, and it has four disulfide bridges. Um, the four disulfide bridges, however, look different if we calculate the anomalous map. So this is one and this is the other. Now, can someone tell me what is the difference between these two, A apart from them being in different places of the molecule? The right one is not um, what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, that, that was, that's actually, it is a disulfide, at least it was a disulfide at the beginning of the experiment. But yes, the bond is breaking. Can I throw? <laughs> um, yeah, that's exactly what happened. The bond started to break from the radiation damage and somehow this was more protected from the radiation damage. So this broke much earlier and you can see like it's, the two sulfurs want to make this movement and it's kind of evident in the density and there's no density between them. Can you relate location of this? Uh, this was on the surface of the protein and this was more in the middle of the protein. Yes. Yeah, possibly this was m closer to radicals that would and uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so, right, now after we know this, can we do radiation damage visualization? Now we take tomatine rib data from Max Nano, measured at the ESA F mat beamline. Um, and the radiation damage has been done with a laser. And there were two data sets, one collected before, then the damage with the laser and then after. We call them before and after. This can be used for phasing, it's called radiation induced phasing. But we are gonna use it to look at the structure. Now, we take the RIP data, which is two data sets, called before and after, they go into Shell XC with the right keywords. If you've got no clue what the right keywords are, what are you going to do? 
Yes. Um, to obtain negative and positive rib density, because here we actually want to know what has vanished and what has been added, we type minus N3, which tells an order we want to calculate something with negative density. And then you need to read it into CUT and tell CUT that it's a difference density map, which you find under map options. And you put in the final structure, put in the rib data, go through shell XC, get the name underscore of a.hkl, get this file, type an order, and there you are. That's what it looks like. So here's another isophyte bridge. Green density means there was something in the before data set and it's gone away in the after data set. Red density means new density showed up in the after radiation damage density. So we can see there was an isophyte bridge but that kind of got less and less occupied. And then new peaks showed up here and here. So clearly the disulfide bridge has been ripped open and there are three new positions and that position here is somehow unpopular. Possibly because it's too crowded and sterically hindered. Here is another part of the molecule. This is a carboxylate group. It vanishes after the radiation damage. No one knows where CO2 goes. There's a new peak here, which is too small. We're not quite sure what happened with it, but we're sure it went away. So not only could we do this with rib density, we could also do this with reaction density. If you would do an in situ crystal experiment, for example, by putting gas into a crystal, triggering a reaction, you could take a data set before and a data set after and you could calculate density like this to see on an almost atomic level what has happened in terms to the of the electron density. Um, so far we haven't seen a case where an order has been used for this. Um, but if you find one, please tell me, I would be very excited about it. Um, so to conclude, an order allows for a fast and effective visualization of the anomalous signal, which is not a totally new thing. Um, radiation damage and heavy atoms. It works well with weak signal. We've seen the cases that we couldn't face with SAD. We could still see the anomalous scatterers. Um, you can localize ligands if they contain, for example, barium. We contained a fluorophore in spinach, which is a fluorescent um, RNA by this way. Um, you can validate your structure if you think that a phosphorus yeah, a phosphate or something else like a chloride or a sulfur, disulfide bridge lies on a certain position, but you're not quite sure about the register, but your anomalous scattering is strong. You can possibly know and use this for validation. You can identify atom types, like in the MAD case I've shown. You can abuse it for MRSAT or use it for the validation of MR solutions. Because of course, if you give a correct MR solution, you have an anomalous data set all the disulfide bridges should be confirmed in the anomalous density. Um, it's available as part of Shellix, but it's a standalone exa file. Um, and you need Shellix C or XPREP to set up the underscore fa.hkl file. And if you use it, um, please cite this so we can keep on making software. And um, I want to thank George Sheldrick, an order was part of my PhD thesis with him, and all the people who supplied me test data for this talk, and you for your attention. <laughs> yes? You, you mentioned that Thomas Petrilic has said about this 10 sigma threshold. Yes. But uh, um, when you don't know the structure, is it meant to be the threshold for the anomalous mass? Yeah, the threshold for the peaks of the anomalous scatterers you want to find. Yeah, but you don't have the structure. You, so you no, you can only do this as a post-mortem analysis. Oh, right. When you ask yourself, why couldn't I face? That can provide yeah. the answer. Um, I also said I'm going to show where the uh, things can be found on the homepage. So if you go to my homepage, You don't have it. You need internet to do this. If you go to my homepage and you see here for tutorial, click here. 
you click on for a tutorial, click here. And the another tutorial <laughs> is <laughs> perhaps <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure why this homepage does it, but perhaps it was in the cache from last week. Perhaps you opened the homepage before I upload it. <laughs> in any case, you find the another part of the tutorial is <coughs> just here. So there's no extra tutorial for Anode because it's task B of the additional tasks. Um, and I'm at your, um, I'm reachable via email or personally if you want to do the tutorial and you get stuck. Any other questions? <coughs>